Oscar when Beyonce was putting out a song like every month. We was like, damn, bitch, sit down. Look, y'all, I think I'm sexy. You see me with my white beat on? 50 with boobs that point to the sky. Hello, love bugs. Hello, Bellas. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com. And if you are not already a part of our book club, please hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on the YouTube. And for a small monthly fee of $5, you babies, yes, you can be privy to all the shenanigans before the YouTube gets it, if the YouTube gets it. I read your comments, okay? I get it, I get it. Ruth Pointer's book is now on the list, y'all. Y'all win, y'all win. Let's continue talking about Anita Pointer and Fritz Pointer's fairy tale, The Pointer Sisters Family Story. To take advantage of the momentum we had created by the hit single Fire, we began working on our seventh studio album with Richard Perry. The album was titled Special Things, and once again, we were off in another musical direction, and it turned out to be a smart move. The hit streak that started with Fires continued when he's so shy, so good looking, he's so shy. That's my shit. But let me tell you what's crazy, y'all. I am far beyond my years in music. It seems like a lot of us are that are a part of this book club because I'm thinking that this song came out like 84, 85. Come to find out this is in the early 80s. Like uh, I think it's 1980 when this song came out and 1980, I'm like nine years old the hit streak that started with fire continued when he so shy hit the top five on the pop charts i knew when i heard it that it would be a hit song i liked the fact that it was a great follow-up to fire but i did have some initial reservations the song was initially titled she's so shy and planned for leo sire but Richard had a different plan. He changed the song to He's So Shy and June sang lead. I was a bit apprehensive because it was reminiscent of songs from the 50s, like He's So Fine, which was a style we were moving away from, but I trusted Richard and the process. I'd initially wanted to sing lead on that song, but Richard thought June's voice worked better and I understood. After all, we had been making compromises throughout our career. And ultimately, I wanted what was best for the group because then we all got the benefits on the Jesus. Why the In Vogue bitches didn't know that? Why they over there uh, arguing and fighting over money and leads and who's doing what and how they get there and everything? Why does it matter for? The only thing that matters is the money. Maxine, Cindy. Uh, what's the other bitch's name? Turd. Was it was four of them, wasn't it? Maxine, Cindy, Turd. Oh, and the crazy one. Don't. Y'all know I'm sensitive about the Vogue because them hoes do their whole career away on some booze. Nick. Corner sisters were enjoying our success with He's So Shy. And we were excited about the new direction. More importantly, we were energized by the reception from fans old and new. I could feel our career heating up and knew that this was no time to pat ourselves on the back. In the music industry, if too much time passes between hits, it can be detrimental to a career. I was not about to let that happen. So when Anita is talking about you cannot lose the momentum because you will drop, okay? That's the reason why 
I don't take breaks. I might take a day off here and there where y'all don't receive a video here and there, but I'm not taking a whole week off. That's impossible. I can't do that unless I make tons of videos in advance and then I'm just not working. You rest when you are at the top. Ashley Says So can do it. Shout out to Ashley Says So. Who else? Uh, it's Rocks. She can do. She can. She can do it. You know her numbers aren't as strong as Ashley says so, but she can do it because I've seen her do it. Plus, she got a full time job. Okay, um, who else can do it? It's a couple of people. Oh, who is that? Lovely T, Tasha K. You know what I'm saying? They can all do it because they have a strong enough platform where they can take a couple of days or weeks off if they choose. Nay Rob is not there yet. I remember when Beyonce was putting out a fucking song like every month, we was like, damn, bitch, sit down. If too much time passes between hits, it can be detrimental to a career. I was not about to let that happen. Also, with June re-engaged in the group, I wanted to make sure we made the most of this opportunity. Yeah, because we don't know. You know, you ain't telling us shit, but we know that that damn June got the propensity to get get missing. Don't worry, y'all. She gonna get into June and her shenanigans later. In 1981, we recorded our eighth studio album titled Black and White. Richard stayed with the same tone of the last record strategically building first on fire and then he's so shy. This was yet another piece of the puzzle as we continued our takeover of the pop music charts. The album had nine songs. Sweet Lover Man, Someday We'll Be Together, Take My Heart, Take My Soul, and I Want a Man with a Slow Hand. Hey, I need a lover with an easy touch. I didn't even know what the fuck that meant back then. We're gonna make it, fall in love again, and should I do it? June and I sang most of the leads. Me on four and her on six. Of course, the smash hit was slow hand. I need a man with a slow hand. During that time, we were also venturing into the world of music videos that were popularized by MTV's a debut in 1981. Soon, music videos were a requirement for any act in the 1980s that wanted to stay on the charts, on the Jeep. So, now that she has said that, let's just all admit, part of the reason why Thriller was the smash that it was, was because Michael Jackson put time, effort, and a whole lot of motherfucking money into them videos. That beat it, Joe. Boom. 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 Back then, if you didn't have a music video, baby, you wasn't going to make it. So back then, you had record labels investing millions. You hear me? into videos because they knew their return would triple, okay, or quadruple. You know, now, that shit didn't fade it off because now all you need is an iPhone. So people ain't investing into uh, videos like they used to because they have features like YouTube. And then when you look at it, if you wasn't investing millions into it, some of them damn videos were so friggin' corny. You'd be like, Joe, how did you make this? And some of them videos, I would think to myself, was just like, what the hell is going on in this video? But it was like they just needed to get something out there to put on one of the video shows so that their song can stay in rotation on the radio child back then radio matter now that shit don't matter no more i love you donnie simpson the next release was the song should i do it in the spring of 1982 with june singing lead with two top 20 hits the album black and white was certified gold in september 1981 reaching number 13 on the billboard 200 album chart and number nine on top R&B hip hop albums. We were fully in the pop area with Slow Hand becoming one of our signature songs. Uh, our career began to pick up steam while Bonnie's stumbled. By 1981, Bonnie's success came to a standstill when Bowen and Gordy became involved in a commercial dispute and Bonnie and Jeffrey left the label. 
Bonnie had to wait until 1984 when she was signed to Private Eye Records. Seen in retrospect, her only Private Eye album, If the Price is Right, was considered by some to be more ambitious, elaborate, and perhaps even better than her Motown efforts with vocals contributed by Ruth and me, and the two tracks written and produced by Brian Holland. After a couple of songs for the film Heavenly Bodies, no new recordings by Bonnie were released. As Private Eye lost a distribution deal with CBS and got into legal problems, leaving her again without a contract. Bonnie said, I went to rehab for a year. Child. And that saved my life and changed my life. I was hanging out with people who were going nowhere and I didn't want to go with them. Getting away from them was the first step. I was a newcomer to crack. Oh! Getting away from them was the first step. I was a newcomer to crack. And even June was ahead of me on this one. I actually turned Jeffrey on to it. I was on crack cocaine for about four years before I went to rehab. The drugs messed up our heads. Our thinking, we started spending too much money on it. Jeffrey had gone to a company called Private Eye and wanted me to go with him. And Barry Gordy wanted me to sign exclusively with him. I decided to stick with my husband. The tensions in Jeffrey and Bonnie's marriage began to manifest, as Bonnie said. He tried to separate me from my family and my friends because that's what you do when you want to control. You try to separate people from their friends and family. I didn't like that. I wasn't accepting that. And I didn't have it. Now, we were married for 20 years, and I was faithful, and I was monogamous. You want to know how I left Jeffrey? We were in a hotel in Hollywood. He started one of his usual arguments, so I said, I'm going to go down the hall and get some ice. I never came back. I got in a limo and never looked back. That's how it ended. You know, as women, we leave mentally far earlier than we leave physically. Once we're gone mentally, bruh, it's a wrap. You hear me? And then just one day you in an argument, you be like, I'll be back. I'm going to the store. You done already started shipping your shit back home to your mammy house. So the nigga don't know that half your wardrobe and half your jewelry's been uh, sitting over there in your mammy's basement. You just be like, I'm just waiting on the perfect day to say I'm gone. And before you know it, he getting on your nerves or she getting on your nerves. And you be like, you know what? I need to walk. And then you walk your ass to your car. You push the button or turn the key, whatever fucking year your car is, and you ride. And you just keep going. In 1982, it was a new year and time for music. This would be our ninth album. Once again, Richard came through for us. The album only had eight tracks, but one of the songs became a theme for us. The first single released was a cover of Prince's song, I Feel For You. It was a modest hit for us and would later become a smash for Shaka Khan. I'm so excited da, 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 and I just can't hide it. Hey, hey, hey. I'm about to lose control and I think I like it. Hey, I'm so excited. That song became an unofficial anthem for us and it was popular when it was released in July of 1982 but would become an even bigger smash later. Breakout was our 10th studio album. It was released in November of 1983 and was aptly titled because it was packed with hit singles. We had struck music gold. We had taken the 80s sound of So Excited one step further. That record had a more electro dance feel. The album did so well in fact that it was re-released the following year. For its original release in 1983, the record had these 10 tracks. Jump! 
for my love. Jump in. Look what you done to me. Something at that and there. All of my defense is down. Neutron dance, easy persuasion. Nightline, telegraph, your love and operation. Another factor that contributed to the astounding success of I'm So Excited was the music video choreographed and directed by Kenny Ortega. True to his word, Richard made sure that June was able to record her own album. I never really doubted it because he was always a big fan of hers. Richard said of June, she got a hard, sexy edge to her voice. She's the personification of the Pointer Sisters, and she sang lead on several songs. So he was sure that she was ready for a solo record. The problem was that with the Pointer Sisters album coming out so close together, June's work was basically overlooked and did not do as well as it could have. The timing was not right. And in the music business, timing is everything. Shit, that's in life. June seemed to take it in stride because she was very proud of our hit album. It's like we were in the laboratory or something. There's no denying that we put a lot of work into our career, particularly in the 1980s after resurrecting the group when two of my sisters wanted to go in different directions. Fortunately, we were able to pull it all back together. In fact, we purposefully omitted lead vocal credits on our albums, even though that may have confused fans who wanted to follow us individually and learn more about each sister. It was quite intentional that we be viewed as a group, a cohesive unit. When I contemplated if and when I should consider my own professional solo moves, I made sure to enjoy it. So basically, Anita took all the money she made during this time and bought her dream home. That's good. Buy your dream home and keep it. That's what you do. You buy it, you pay that shit off, and you keep it. As the Porter Sisters, we were at the top of our game. And it was everything I had imagined. We were headlining and selling out concerts around the world and appearing on TV regularly. Our videos were in high rotations and we were putting out music yearly to keep our audience satisfied. We were racking up awards. The and night of the 1985 American Music Awards, we had just come off a tour with Lionel Richie and were in a dressing room when someone came running up the stairs and said that several folks wanted to meet us at the A&M Recording Studios after the awards show. And the session would include Michael Jackson, Quincy Jones, and Stevie Wonder. It was very secretive. already done so please remember to like share the facebook subscribe and visit uptopbeauty.com now remember this the same people that you meet on the way up will always be the same people that you meet on the way down my naysayers my patron loves you babies you have a good one